seamount because if it was more of if it was more of when it was shallow wouldn't it have just been worn down like the flat top or like the rest of the volcano was uh okay if i understand the question correctly you're asking wouldn't this specific geological feature um be a result of some sort of secondary magmatic process and yes that's that's the current um, hypothesis. Max downslope is going to be 13 degrees. What's that? The downslope is 13 degrees on average. Right. Up. So we got a couple different paramecia here. It looks like some um, <coughs> hemicorallium, big bamboos, um, some sponges. So this is really. You know, this has got quite a diversity on, you know, and a moderate abundance of coral life up here. Um, looks like there's a little Victicorgia in there. So we got a pretty good showing of, of corals here for a relatively um, flat area. I'm assuming being the highest point on this feature, it's just up in the currents and you're getting a lot of flow. Uh, so it makes, it does make sense, um, but this is or there's a good explanation for why they're here, um, but this is not always what I would expect. We dove a lot of these kind of secondary cones um, in and around Johnson Atoll uh, in 2015 when I was around there, and a lot of these cones are pretty boring. So this is a really nice showing. Brian, you look, work a lot with the Phoenix Islands. How does uh, uh, how does this area compare with the Phoenix no, Islands? We want to hold. It's pretty similar uh, in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah, um, the uh, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty similar. Similar species, similar um, um, kind of similar topography or bathymetry. Um, we haven't th done any dives near islands uh, on this expedition just because the two islands here, Kingman and Palmyra, um, are right. comparatively very well explored. So we've been trying to extend the coverage in this area. But around the Phoenix Islands, we have done a lot of islands work. And so we get shallower into the, um, you know, hundreds of meters and even into the mesophotic a little bit. Um, so we've, we've seen different communities at different depths. But for this depth range, um, they're pretty similar. We're a little bit further north here. The Phoenix Islands, the northernmost island, Baker is, or is it Howland? Howland is like two degrees, two and a half degrees north. We're up at the seven and a half degrees north here. So we're in a little bit of a different current regime uh, and a probably a little bit lower primary product surface primary productivity. Um, so there are some larger scale differences between the islands, um, but you couldn't show me a picture of here and show me a picture of there and I wouldn't wouldn't be able to tell you the difference immediately. Um, where do you learn about the different current re current regimes in this general region of the Central Pacific? There's a couple of good papers. I have to go find the one I usually use. Um, I don't forget who the author was, but there are a couple of decent physical or good physical oceanographic descriptions of here. Um, the equatorial current system that's right on the equator is really complicated and so there's a, a decent amount of work that's been done describing the all the currents and countercurrents um, there that are also have a role in El Nino uh, and La, uh, La Nina formation. Um, up here we're kind of out of that strong equatorial current processes though so it makes it a little bit harder and potentially more variable what the currents here, or at least the surface currents here, are doing. That's one of the reasons we've kind of done as much work in the Phoenix Islands as we have, is trying to understand how the super strong surface currents that you know are very much restricted due to the Coriolis effect of how far north and south they um, wander, um, and how much of a biogeographic barrier those strong surface currents may provide to deep sea organisms. And we don't have an answer for that yet. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also where the 
such hull mounted uh, ADCPs, acoustic Doppler current profilers, will come in really handy, um, which this ship just got very recently and we're still kind of getting a sense of how to use it uh, on this vessel. What would that entail? Like, um, I've never heard of this acoustic Doppler. It's it's basically exactly the same sensor as the DVL that Hercules uses to help navigate the Doppler velocity log. It, it's a, a multi-beam, multi-beam as in like four beams as opposed to like 800 in the terms of the, eight, uh, the what we call a multi-beam sonar for bathymetric mapping, but it has four different sound beams and it measures the Doppler shift of particles in the water column or the bottom and you can get an idea of current velocity and direction uh, at multiple slices of depth below the ship's hull and that really oh. helps us to find the motion of the surface currents. So given given our smudges on the lenses here I can't do much with zooms so covering area um, and getting kind of a general distribution of the coral is probably a higher priority than getting a lot of tight zooms because they just can't see the polyps well enough um, in the main HD and things that are particularly difficult to ID we can try and look at with the still cam but kind of navigating here with one hand tied behind my back with the um, smudges on the camera lens so we can kind of keep moving I think would be my preference. All right. But being a little lower in altitude would help too. Uh, yeah, then we're not uh, getting any well, valid laser data, is that correct? Yeah, we're not worried about the laser data right now. Right. So a shark thing? Yep, another one oh. of those little dog shark. I missed it. Just swam out and I didn't get no nope. picture of it. Oh there it is. Oh there it is, yeah. Just kind of following the rocks there off the south. Get back out of get back in line here. We've seen quite a few of these guys. So Hemicorallium's here, lots of paramaricias, good number of bamboos, good number of promoids. Really nice community here. You can see the fans are all generally li lined up in the same direction um, with the current flow. These big bamboos here getting up higher into the current. Do you want another EDNA? This is, this is the exact same community we just saw. Once that eDNA paper is filtered out and sent out to the various scientists, how long do you think it would take for them to analyze it and create a response or be able to create a good profile of all the corals and everything that's around there? So doing the actual individual sample isn't all that time consuming. Okay. Um, okay. Doing it at scale is time consuming. And so, you know, the actual prep any one sample doesn't take a lot of prep time. You, you know, takes in less than an, probably an hour to do the DNA extraction, substantially less than an hour for one sample, and then throw it in a PCR for a um, couple hours of cycling and then send it off and then get it back a couple weeks later from whoever your sequencing pro sequencer processor is. Um, but doing that at scale on the t order of hundreds of samples over multiple expeditions uh, and then doing the a lot of the time-consuming work is in the bioinformatics on the background, backside of getting, you know, a gigabyte of ATCs and Gs 
uh, and then trying to start piecing those together um, to make heads or tails and then comparing the sample sequences and lining them up and all that is really the time consuming part is is the com the yeah bioinformatics part of the data processing once you get the sequences back this is a nice um <coughs> cliptophora um it's a member of the primnoid family another couple big sea pens out here in the sediment continuing to see a few of these hemichoralliums as well When I think about the kind of the biggest technology changes in my relatively short career, um, the the speed at which we can do genetics work and the ease is just every year it's it's noticeably better, cheaper, faster, quicker. Um, you know, it, it's amazing to me how the speed at which we get to um, be able to do. DNA sequencing and stuff like that from the point I remember being in middle school and you know the Human Genome Project just being one of the greatest scientific endeavors ever and billions of dollars to do 90% of the human genome and now we can you know a grad student in the course of one chapter of their dissertation can do a genome for a new organism um, it's pretty amazing to me that in just a little over 20 years, we've gone from thousands of people working together for one genome to it being a commercial enterprise, that it's really just a matter of money to pay a company to do it for you in the matter of a couple of weeks. Yeah, the speed of technology is insane. And I have to admit, if you get, I, I don't know, I don't do enough genetics work to really be able to describe how the process for next generation sequencing truly works, but the, what they do with it is, is just mind blowing with the ability to tag different DNA base pairs with fluorescence and then just laser read the whole thing. And so they basically just wash, they, they attach all the little segments of DNA onto a, um, and glue it onto basically a card and then wash it with a fluorescent tag and then use a laser to interrogate the wavelength of each of the different um, wells in the card. And they know that, you know, blue is tagged to G's, red is tagged to T's, whatever. And then they can just wash it with another chemical, release those tags, and then wash it with another thing. And they just do this literally thousands of times and use a laser to interrogate what each of the um, specific next base pair is in the sequence. And it's mind blowing. Um, really efficient compared to how they used to do it. So are there, what is our nearest area of volcanism to this current location? Is it Hawaii, Tonga, or another area? Kilauea. In the main Hawaii, and on the Big Island of Hawaii, would be the closest. Mauna Loa erupted not too long ago. Again. Oh, are you, right. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up. Which 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 volcano is which? The Big Island of Hawaii, whether it be Mauna Loa or Kilauea. Yeah. That was the first time since the early '80s. Okay. So. Chris, do you know why that one erupted, or was it? Uh, just a release of pressure. Okay. Just to build <laughs> up. So. Got and then there, I mean, that's like one of the study of, that's why people study volcanoes, is to try and understand the causes or mechanisms of eruption. Um, but gas built up is one. Uh, if there's some sort of, why you're not going to really get like tectonics like you would maybe in California or um, like the Cascades region. Like if there was a earthquake or something that could trigger um, an event of volcanism, um, a chain, I mean, yeah. It's mostly like gas pressure, water content. Um, it's gonna have an effect, whatever the chemistry of the rock is. 
But that brings up an, uh, a great question that I have been hearing a little bit about lately, which is how is it that like a, a super- I got enough leash. I mean, if you've got, okay, if you've got time, yeah. Yeah, stop her up. Bridge now. Can we hold position, please? Thank you. I totally forgot too, Brian. Sorry. Oh, we all did. Got distracted with pretty lights. Yeah. <laughs> the lasers were shiny. This little patch on the right is perfect. Right here. And if we can just get down near the seafloor before we trip it, that'd be perfect. Can do. How far away do you need to be to collect a really good eDNA sample? We don't, we don't know yet. Honest answer. Um, we're trying to get within a couple meters of like the center of the community. So it looks like we got a couple primnoans, um, hemicrallium, multiple paramercia, one cup coral, maybe a black coral, something I'm not having trouble recognizing. We haven't uh, pulled any of these, right? Don't believe uh, nope. so. All good. All right, Niskin six. And what's the sample number? Sample number is 136. 136, I thank you. So that's something, I don't know if, if Steve and Meredith are particularly looking at um, exactly the distance, but th this is a very, very new kind of technology or methodology. So getting a sense of what, um, how close we have to be, what constitutes a high density community are all things that they're, they're still trying to figure out. And then are the Niskin bottles filled with air? And then when you pull it, the air is released? Nope, they're, they're cocked open. So they're open on the bottom and the top. Um, so when we're moving through the water, water's flushing through them. And then when we quote fire them, um, it, they release the spring loaded, um, top and bottom stoppers and then seal that water. Thank you know, you. The, the design the design was made for vertical moving CTDs that go up and down in the water. Um, and so I don't actually know like with the vehicle moving horizontally and the bottle still oriented vertically, I actually don't know like in the quick run we just did, I don't know how much they're flushing through truly. Um, that, that's a, a question mark still in my mind. If you look at them on uh, what we call a rosette array um, off of a large CTD, they're generally in a ring on a circular frame that's moving vertically and the bottles are lined up with the direction of travel. And so it is a pretty a, a pretty clear cut like what you're in is, come up. the water mass you're in is um, the water mass flowing through the bottles but there's a lot more turbulence moving around the ROV. Are we um, ready, Dan? So yeah. I don't know how much mixing really occurs. Bridge nav. Can we move five zero meters to six zero, zero point five knots, please? Big, beautiful Aritagorgia, two of them here. Thank you. I don't know if you got it or not. I wasn't watching. I 
did. Yep. There's actually two. There's another one right behind it. So going back to the Niskins and what you were just saying, how they're positioned vertically, is there a way that you could like rotate them horizontally? Uh, not, not easily, but I mean, on an engineering ex exercise, certainly. If you want, I could do one knot. I don't know how far it is across there. Let's not do quite that fast in case we find something that's worth stopping at. All right. we, we're making plenty of good time at half a knot. Early on this dive, have you seen anything that's uh, particularly interesting to you or from a geological standpoint? Um, I mean, hearing Kevin in the chat or seeing his responses um, was interesting just because, I don't know, this area is very confusing geologically in terms of uh, history, magmatic history, so that was interesting to me. Uh, for those of us that can't see the science chat, can you kind of give a little synopsis of what he said? Yeah, so um, I guess the long answer is just that uh, the region we're looking at right now, kind of this group of seamounts termed the Line Islands, we're specifically looking at uh, Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll area. Um, but there's a really long line of these islands uh, that are thought to all be, they're all volcanic and um, very old. And so, however, we don't know the specific ages and there's no clear age chronology along the islands. Like that's something that you see with uh, the Hawaiian Emperor Seamount chain. So there's, a lot of thoughts on what creates these different ages of the seamounts. So there's a couple different theories that I've mentioned before, but this particular this particular um, right. feature we're looking at, uh, there's an idea, I guess, that the volcanoes have reactivated after millions of years of subsidence by some separate geodynamic process um, or it could have happened quite soon after subsidence so and what is subsidence like after it's so like after hardened? so like the idea is that there's a hot spot which is like vol Hawaiian volcanism is similar and the Pacific plate moves over the hot spot and that's why you get all these little um, volcanoes all around so after it moves away from the hot spot it's no longer warm there's no magma that's kind of lifting it up. It cools and kind of compresses. So a DSC um, there for you, Carly, if you want. Thank you. Might need to adjust the settings uh, a little zoom bit. In. There. Let's see.
All right, that's good. Thanks. Yeah, uh, hydro zone. I think from Noah. We got a picture. So now to clarify, Corley, all like there is no current volcanic activity going on, no thermal vent activity going on anywhere around these line islands. No, not that I know of. I'd be very I mean any not anything's possible. Anything's possible. But I'd be very, very surprised. Unlikely. I mean this volcanism is you know, thought to be, I think the ages range from like, I think where we are specifically, like 60 million uh, years would probably be there. at the lower end of ages. Um, and then maybe even up to 80 and a more. Might be a little less than 60. Um, Sorry, but guys, the, I landed there and it dusted yeah. it up. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great answer. around this time of the night I always start getting so cold. Well this will probably be the last step. <laughs> Starting to get some sonar returns and let it swing in. I don't know how steep it is over there. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be super steep. Although I can tell you exactly how steep. Quilly, uh, we have a question online, and I'm just going to read it out uh, verbatim. So, would it not have been a secondary volcanic process to form a cone like this on top of the flat top tsunami, or an area of volcanism like on the other side of the Pacific might trigger? like an earthquake or a volcano door wrapped on the opposite side of the Pacific? I don't necessarily Should, think that that's happened. That yeah, I don't necessarily lately. think, I don't Maybe think that that necessarily like a, happened. So something like the earth, like for, take for instance, like the earthquake that happened in Japan, what was it like 2011, I think? Um, it was a huge earthquake and it triggered a tsunami. Like, for that, for instance, um, like, those are going to be kind of, like, a little bit closer, or, like, the tsunami that happened in Indonesia. Like, those are earthquakes that are nearer mm -hmm. to those places. Um, I think there was, like, the tsunami that happened in Japan, like, we saw some big waves in California, but I don't think it would trigger... Any kind of volcanism on the other shore. It shouldn't, and I haven't heard of that yet. That's just, okay, sorry, that's, like, so interesting, because I even just finished reading a book where that was, like, one of the plot lines of it. Clearly a work of fiction. But I'm thank you for setting the record straight on that. I mean, that. I don't know for sure. I've just, I've never heard of that. <laughs> no, 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 I'm believing the geology... Uh, and the deep sea coral biology experts. A couple of Walteria sponges here, which are a little bit new for this dive. I think I saw one earlier. We've seen a nice little group of um, of Victorgia too as we were moving over that last clump of corals. Yes, please. We might need to slow down here in the not too distant future because we will start picking up a little more slope. But I'm pretty happy with the speed right now. We're seeing mo much of the same stuff.
Going back to Brian and eDNA, uh, a question was asked, is there still some issues with looking at DNA of different organisms since the majority of the genomic tools were developed for humans? So there is a little, <clears throat> so let me try and figure out, there's a couple different ways, to, parts of the puzzle. Um, so the DNA is, is for the most part DNA. Um, so that's not, that's consistent, like messing, you know, once you get extracted DNA, um, it's the same across all life, you know, life on earth. Um, so once you've got a, 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 you know, a vial of just purified DNA, it doesn't matter where it came from. Now purifying the DNA 100% is different. Um, and the different proteins and cell walls and all those things from all the different types of life extracting the dna can be difficult depending on um I mean, there's certain classes like if you're going to buy a dna extraction kit um you buy one that targets plants or you buy one that targets animals or whatever but sometimes that isn't the best or whatever so there is definitely some optimization based on um on what's the cell material in the cell wall and the chemical compounds, like some heavily pigmented um, organisms are harder to extract DNA from than others because the pigment interferes with the process or the chemicals involved. So the extraction can vary a lot. And then when you're amplifying the DNA through uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, um, you have to target certain areas of the DNA for amplifying. And so you do generally, that has to be taxon somewhat taxon specific on how you design your primers um, and then in the data informatics part you know if you need some reference databases and stuff like that to help build your um, build your genome and so having a closely related um, genome already sequence makes your life a lot easier so it's kind of a yes and no answer um, to the question that was that was really awesome. Thank you. So I guess this other question is uh, a <laughs> goes out to everybody in the band. Have we ever seen another foreign entity's navy ships, like the Canadian Navy or Coast Guard, the United States Navy Coast Guard, or any other foreign entity? I, I haven't seen any. I haven't seen anything out here. <laughs> Yesterday we saw birds. the very first boat. Oh really? Mm -hmm. Brian pointed it out. I certainly have. Yeah, I've definitely. When we're when we're working in other countries' waters, um, it's not infrequent for uh, one of their official vessels to, you know, be seen either in port or underway. Um, I've worked in countries that required naval observers, and we've actually had naval officers from the host country on the ship to make sure we were doing what we were permitted to do and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, we, I've definitely seen multiple other navies. I remember on the ONC cruise, we're pretty sure we saw a submarine come up. Big, big, beautiful Primnoid here we're looking at. Um, Yeah, and if you're operating, especially around Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. um, you see a lot of U.S. Navy um, interactions. Yeah, very good point. Science, do we need, are we doing any more laser work? Pablo, Kevin, do you have um, wishes or things before we end? We're probably going to be wrapping up in the not-too-distant future with this dive. Uh, I think we're good. I'm still taking data every once in a while. Just okay. to baselines and then we'll do a water column uh, science on the way up. Well we're getting we're, we're I'm gonna use we're gonna use this as a transect so like we're we're gonna the taxonomy might be a higher order but I'm I can at this speed and since we've seen most of these organisms, we're, uh, this is still useful for getting the coverage and distribution of the corals. I'm not asking for zooms because I can't see the individual polyps since the camera is smudged, but um, this level, like I can tell these are all primnoids mixed in with bamboos. And so getting the distribution 
of where they are in the size classes is still useful science. Um, Okay, you want to keep cruising toward waypoint four then? Yes, please. Okay. Um, step size, does it matter to you now that we're going down slope? Okay. Bridge nav. Uh, can we move five zero meters two six five, please? Thank you. Brian, we have another question about EDMA. Yep, but we do need to be a little bit closer to the seafloor for it to work. Well. Coralie, can you talk to us a little bit about volcanism? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there was that National Geographic documentary that came out a while back. Uh, what was it, like Fire of Love, Flame of Love, about the two volcanologists from back in the late 80s, early 90s, partially in the 70s. Um, husband, wife team, two partners. I'm sorry? What's up? Um, but I'm one of looking sure. this up. What's it called? Like Fire of Love, Flame of Love. But it's on National Geographic on Disney Plus. Fire of Love. There we go. I don't know if it won any awards, but I know it was nominated for a bunch. So this husband-wife team, um, we're talking about. They classified volcanoes in two different ways, gray volcanoes and um, red volcanoes. Red volcanoes being like the Hawaii volcanoes. They're predictable, they're life-giving. Um, and they said that they feel perfectly safe around those types of volcanoes. And then they talked about another one, the gray volcanoes like Mount St. Helens eruption. Um, yeah, so, okay, so the, okay. So the reason why they said that is because there's two different types of, not two different types, there's like many different types of volcanism that we see, but we typically talk about basaltic vol volcanoes, um, which are the ones in Hawaii, and the ones at the mid-ocean ridge, and the ones that we're on right now. These are all bas basaltic. Um, and so they have a specific chemical composition that's more, uh, it has more of like a mantle signature to it. Mm -hmm. Whereas like those more explosive volcanoes are generally um, on, found on continents. So they're going up through continental crust. Whereas like the basaltic volcanism is just going through oceanic crust, which is literally just, it's kind of like the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you start to include more elements into your magma and including more elements into your magma. When they go through the continental crust. Yeah. Okay. So we called those like more evolved, like the more stuff it has into it, that's uh -huh. like very different from like a mantle signature is gonna be a more evolved magma. Um, generally these, we call like, so something like Mount St. Helens or um, Pompeii, mm -hmm. uh, these are very, very explosive because they have a different chemical composition than basalt. Uh, it's it really has to do a lot with the viscosity as well. So basaltic volcanism is gonna have a magma with low viscosity and viscosity is just a term that, I think the literal definition is um, like the, it has to do with flow. I'm literally forgetting the de definition, but it's resistance to flow. So mm -hmm. basalt is gonna be kind of more flowy, more gooey. So less viscosity less viscosity, um, but a rhyolitic 
volcano is going to be really viscous. It's going to be really resistant mm -hmm. to flow. So what it's going to do is explode. Gotcha. Um, and you can get explosive volcanism in, in basaltic volcanoes as well. So it's not to say, oh, don't be scared of basaltic volcanoes. Around any sort of volcano, you're going to have really high temperature of rocks. There's also, you're, a lot of times people are like, don't think about all of the toxic gases that are around and present. Yes. Also, yes. when things are cooling really quickly, you can get glass shards, like microcrystalline glass shards. You don't want to inhale those. Um, so there's a lot of toxic products around volcanism as well that are unsafe to be around. So it's not to say don't, you shouldn't be scared of those. You should always be yes, careful always, when navigating. Always. <laughs> don't volcano. go around exploding volcanoes. Um, but. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> and and generally, like, generally, you would never be around a volcano. Um, people who go around Hawaiian volcanoes are highly trained experts. Yeah, professionals. And one poor tourist boat. Yeah. <laughs> Really pretty area. Gorgia here, we're still moving through the same kind of similar communities, but we're seeing these big, um, the size class on this side of the feature is much larger than we were seeing earlier, um, which I don't know what the cause of that or if it's, um, you know, you got an N of one here, but we're moving through these big, large corals here when um, previously we were seeing much smaller ones when we first came into the other side. I missed most of the east facing wall here so I don't know how it compares um, but it is a pretty nice community here um, before we get out of here can we trip another Niskin and take another eDNA sample in this area please and Brian from what I remember these are much larger than the other side okay that's kind of what I was assuming because <coughs> they did not the pass down I got did not include um, a description like this Yeah, understood. I'm, I'm trying to get a hold of Dwight to talk about what to do next. So I don't want to make a dramatic move yet. No, yep, Pablo got him. He's getting up. He's on his way up. Thanks. Uh, Roger, Roger. All right. Uh, is there a rock that we can, any of these rocks just to the left sampleable? Yep. And then after we sample the rock, I propose we recover. What about that one? Or this one. As we're uh, collecting this rock sample, we have a question for the LaserBot team. As we're flying along, uh, you know, kind of on the fly, what's the swath that you're getting with the laser? So about how large are you uh, getting in the laser? Corley, do you see a rock you particularly want? Yeah, so um, it's going to depend on how far we are from the, from the ground, uh, the altitude. Uh, so it will vary between 
about uh, 10 millimeters to 15 to 20 millimeters. So it's uh, coin size. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome, thank you. It looks a little too small. Um, can we take back off? Yeah. Most awesomest rock ever. <laughs> um, how okay. about is this one? Oh, 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 no. oh, too many people touching the screen. Sorry. Disregard. Um, yeah. Yes. Any of those three look like they would work just fine. Even that one. Copy. Bestest rock coming up. That one looks super cemented. This one might be the move. Copy that. Yep, I can go for that one. I'm happy with that. You happy with that? Yep, very happy. Put it in a box. The aft starboard bio box, the larger one, is open. Pesky push cores. Seriously. That one? Roger. Copy. All right, so once we get this sample stowed, we're going to go ahead and call the dive here so we can come up and squeegee the lens. Um, and then we'll be uh, mapping for a little while and get back in the water sometime later today or early tomorrow. Yep, for those watching, Didn't we do we know about do the smudge on her, on the Zeus cam. Yeah. That's one of the reasons that no, we're we, coming we up a little bit early. Right in this area, so that's good enough. Sorry, Katie, what'd you say? Nope, just uh, got a couple of questions about the smudge on the camera again. Okay. Just addressing those. Well, thanks everyone for a good dive. Yay.
So we have a couple of quick fire questions that came in. Um, I'm off blue. So for Brian, what percentage Copy. of the life in the deep sea do we have DNA records for? Uh, off the hand, I don't know. Um, I would say a very small percentage. Yeah, certainly, certainly across all life, a very small percentage. Um, Meredith and Steve's efforts here in the Central Pacific are racking up, um, you know, a reasonable percentage of the common coral taxa they're beginning to get records for. Um, and then there are a couple of big projects that are trying to build databases. Ocean Genome Legacy at Northeastern. Wood, Tim Schenk at Woods Hole is running a program that I'm drawing a blank on the name of it right now. Um, so there are a couple attempts at large scale um, records for deep sea um, and ocean in general um, genetic kind of databases. Um, but yes, it is definitely on the barely starting end of the scale um, compared to being most of them. And then we have another question. Like I said, we got a couple of quick fire ones. Do military ships ever map the seafloor and not share those maps? Absolutely. Yep. There are lots of maps out, out in the world that are not publicly available. And have we taken any pitch course today? Nope, we did not. It's been a while since we've taken a push core, hasn't yep. it? Yeah, our yeah, the sand the, is just not very sand, conducive. It's been, yeah, it's been coarse enough that it's not really holding a suction well and they're, they're falling out. We got uh, enough for most of the push cores we've been collecting this uh, expedition have been uh, for a couple pilot projects looking at um, the neofauna for collaborators, so they, we've gotten them enough for them to kind of test their methodologies uh, and refine them. But we, we didn't have a specific science objective because we don't have any Miofana people that are doing at scale work right now. Yeah, thank you. A uh, question just kind of for, not sure who, uh, about how long will it take us to ascend up to the surface? Just shy of an hour. Thank you. All right, question for the laser bot team. Uh, when we're shooting the laser at any living creatures, like earlier today we did on a sponge, um, a coral, and then the other dive on a crab and a sea urchin, does the laser do any kind of harm or damage, cause any pain to those creatures? No, that's a great question, Kitty, and something that we considered, of course, before we even thought about doing that. So the answer is no, uh, there's no harm. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of the times in the lab, uh, you know, we protect our eyes because those are delicate, but uh, but we move our arms in front of the laser, uh, touch the skin, and nothing, nothing happens. Hurt. So it, it looks bright, but it's uh, really not that uh, intense uh, on any organic pigment. So, uh, yeah, no harm. Yeah. And then have we seen anything just particularly interesting? I know I've asked you this several times, but for those just joining, have we seen anything particularly interesting on this dive? Yeah, today I think the, the main highlight was uh, that we identified uh, now categorically, I mean, we're sure about that, is a, a pigment called beta carotene. Uh, and this is a, a sort of sunblock uh, pigment mm -hmm. that life develops uh, to protect from ultraviolet radiation from the sun. And, uh, uh, and here it is in the deep sea. It's in the deep sea because it's a tough one, uh, as you can imagine, it serves to protect. Uh, 
everything. Uh, in fact, we've seen the the highest loads of uh, carotene in algae up in volcanoes, uh, mm -hmm. the opposite. So the tallest volcanoes in the world, uh, they're loaded with uh, red uh, pigmented algae, uh, which are full of this carotene pigment. But anyway, so this happens, of course, in the ocean as well and everywhere on, on land. Uh, as this uh, algae uh, die and they become marine snow, or the trial uh, organic matter, as uh, scientists like to call it, uh, they will uh, come down into the bottom of the ocean and, and some of it still is preserved there. Uh, low temperature, there's nothing going on there chemically, uh, so they will stay there for a long time. So that's what we saw today. And uh, we have sort of seen it in previous dives, but today it was confirmed uh, with stronger signals. So I think that's for us <laughs> a big win. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I want to ask Chris a question first and then just kind of pass it around the van. But I feel like we always start going left to right, so I'd like to go right to left. But what uh, what path has kind of led you to being on board the Nautilus? Um, well, I've had a pretty roundabout uh, path. Very diverse, yeah. yeah. I've done a lot of different things. But uh, I've always been interested in marine biology since I was in second grade. I always wanted to be a marine biologist. So I studied at Hawaii Pacific University for my undergrad. I went to James Cook University for my grad school uh, for my master's. And then um, I worked for a while as an observer for the National Marine Fishery Service on fishing boats. And then after that, I kind of deviated away from marine mm -hmm. science for a while. I taught high school biology for a bit. Um, I went and worked for multiple years in Africa with primates and did some sea turtle work and then uh, recently well, a couple years ago I started working as a station manager at Palmyra Atoll but actually in these intermittent times I was a cook and a bartender <laughs> while I was looking for other work <laughs> and so being a cook led me to Palmyra so I started out my first season there in the galley so I was cooking for everybody and got to see uh, how a research station works again, which was nice and kind of rekindled my um, my desire to work in with the marine environment. So from there, I moved up to the manager, and then um, just talking to people out there. Uh, actually, Lynette was the one that first told me about the job uh -huh. available, so I applied for it, and here I am. Awesome, thank you. So Brian, can I ask the same question? I know you again have a very diverse background. Yeah, so um, I announced when I was five I wanted to be a, be a marine biologist. And uh, so it's always kind of been heading that way, but it definitely took different roundabout approach. Um, so in high school, I was part of the National Ocean Sciences Bowl team for my high school and got really into that uh, competition all through high school. And then college, I studied um, marine. My major was marine biology. My minor was geology. <clears throat> and actually a lot of my research ended up being more on the geology side, but kind of that that blending zone in the eco between ecology and geology um, where they, what? Oh, there's a plagiothuria. That's the thing I've been telling you about this whole oh, expedition. Oh, oh, oh. Um, Hold on, highlight, highlight. highlight. And um, the, um, so I spent a lot of time in undergrad learning sonars and uh, marine remote sensing between multi-beam side scan and sub-bottom profiling. I did a couple cruises on NOAA ships, uh, interning and with uh, learning their multi-beam sonars, and got a, a certificate in multi-beam data processing on a, a now old software called Keras. Um, oh, that's what you were talking about last night. Yeah, 
and then I took a little bit of a deviation from the direct science track and got into science operations. So I joined the NOAA Corps, which is um, the NOAA Uniformed Officer Corps. It's the smallest of the uniformed services of the federal government. And you already had your degree, already been an established scientist when you joined them. Well, I don't know if I'd say an established scientist, but I, I yeah, yes, I joined um, after graduating with a, a BS in marine biology um, and had done some shallow water coral work and had done the mapping um, kind of stuff and had done some habitat characterization work within scuba diving depths. Um, so I'd had a couple experiences, but I was generally just an intern in two or three different projects. Um, and then in the way NOAA Corps works is you, they take science majors, STEM field um, college graduates and then teach them uh, science operations. So I went to a couple months at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy and learned to drive ships. And so then my first assignment um, was as a junior officer on the Okeanos Explorer, which is the federal vessel that has a very similar mission to what Nautilus does. And my primary job there was literally just driving the ship. So I was on the other end of the intercom with the navigator. I was controlling the DP system for the vessel and moving the ship and whatnot. And then I, <coughs> that was fun, but I kind of missed the science. And so I spent the next few years getting more and more engaged in the mission side of exploration in a couple different ways, getting back to my roots of running the sonar sometimes, getting into the navigation chair, uh, learning a lot about the video and satellite telecommunications that makes telepresence work. Uh, got to do a little co-piloting or, or um, serious piloting, which is the camera sled on the NOAA ship. Uh, and then I started moving into more of the project management. So I started being an expedition coordinator, uh, which is NOAA's term for expedition lead. Um, and doing all the logistics and planning and permitting and all that for work. And then I got more into the project management and started running some of the budgets and eventually became the deputy program manager for the entire Okeanos Explorer program. Uh, and that time, by the time I did that, I realized I was way too far away from the science and was really just running spreadsheets and driving a desk for the most part. I was still sailing, but it, my, most of my job was bureaucratic headache. And so after eight years of doing the operations and management side, I uh, resigned from NOAA and started grad school. And then I spent the last five years at Boston University getting my PhD, um, working on deep sea uh, ecology in the Central Pacific on these seamounts, exactly what we're exploring out here, um, looking at patterns of life on a regional scale. Um, and now I'm here and I don't know what I'm doing next. <laughs> Thank you. So can I toss the same question over to the laser dive bot team? What path led you out here on the Nautilus? Uh, so a <laughs> uh, <laughs> little bit more exotic. Uh, I started studying the ancient oceans of Mars, uh, which took me to study the oceans of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, which to get there and to one day be able to deploy technology on those missions, uh, we need to learn how to use it somewhere. So uh, the closest and the cheapest way to to do it is uh, testing our tech in, in our own ocean. So in a you know brief summary, that's kind of, uh, I went to Mars further away and then back to our own oceans <laughs> to, to, to learn. And yeah, so that's- So any big uh, eye-opening discoveries or any fun facts you would like to share about the ancient oceans of Mars? Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of them. So in fact, you know, we, we still don't know much about them. We uh, we know that um, for some time they were very acidic. They were almost sulfuric acid uh, really? uh, based and which meant that some of the rocks that we can see today uh, come from that ocean. That's how we learned that they were acidic oceans is by looking back at the rocks today. Uh, from where they came from, and uh, to me that was a very interesting uh, discovery. That was in 2004, and I was in grad school, uh, studying grad school back then. And, and uh, there is a place in Spain, from where I'm from, uh, that hosts one of the largest examples of the type of water that we think Mars hosted back in the day. Uh, this acidic very rich in iron. Uh, it's called Rio yeah. Tinto, like a Tinto wine. So it's uh -huh, the same color uh -huh. as red wine. And, uh, and that 
to me sparked my interest in in looking at Mars uh, because suddenly that place became a you know almost like Disneyland for NASA scientists and all, all scientists trying to understand oh wow okay so if this water is like the water that we had on Mars and this water has life uh -huh. to look for life on Mars maybe we have to look for the same things that we find here so this became a kind of the I guess the beginning of a new field called astrobiology mm -hmm. uh, in which we're looking at extremophiles or these organisms that only like to live in places where we thought they couldn't live like low pH, so very acidic, uh, high temperature like the thermal vents, uh, no light like the bottom of the ocean. As we start discovering these uh, extreme environments that are very much like uh, other planets, like even Venus clouds, right? Uh, all the acidic and hot temperature, even cold and dry as Mars, but it was wet and warm earlier on. So all these places uh, suddenly uh, on Earth became terrestrial laboratories to practice how to eventually look for life elsewhere. So to me, that's kind of the genesis of all my career in a way is, you know, trying to explore our own planet to prepare us to find life elsewhere. So elsewhere, that's the yeah. connection uh, for us. And, you know, the ocean here, it's perhaps the origin of life uh, right on Earth, uh, most likely, at least uh -huh. according to some sci most scientists. And, and so if you're looking for life 2.0 or life elsewhere, uh, Oceans is probably the way to go. So you can look at ancient oceans, Mars, current oceans, uh, like uh, Europa, for example, on Jupiter. And again, what a, best pl what a better place than our own ocean to, to do two things, right? One is to learn how to do it in other planets, but also to learn our own ocean. And we heard today that we have mapped only a tiny fraction of our yeah, ocean, uh, yeah. just mapping, which is easy. When you talk about doing scientific studies, which is much harder, uh, it's even less. So to me, being able to kill two birds with one stone, right? So prepare us to explore other planets by learning how to, you know, how our ocean works. It's really, really, very fulfilling. So I'm very happy to be here. So in your opinion, do you think, and I have to ask, do you think that there is a second genesis on Europa or Enceladus or even Mars? Yes, uh, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, I don't speak on behalf of anybody else uh, today. Uh, yes, and it's a, it's a numbers game. Uh, you know, by, with so many galaxies, so many stars, so many mm -hmm. planets around the stars, so many of those at the right place, you know, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, so many moons in other planets that are also, yeah, not too hot, not too cold, uh, just the right conditions chemically, geologically, uh, it's, it's, again, it's statistically speaking, it would be really, really hard. I mean, that's when I start thinking about bigger, uh, perhaps beings uh, directing things, uh, religions and all of that. Uh, if you, you know, but if you really, you know, are, are grounded in numbers and believe in statistics, Mm -hmm. which you should, uh, it's really, really a numbers game. So, you know, whether it's life in our solar system, Mars, uh, the moons of Jupiter, uh, or other solar system, Alpha Centauri, which is the closest one, right? So it's just a matter of time that uh, we figured out a way to find unique evidence of life 2.0 as well. Yeah. I'm really excited about uh, the Raman spectrometer's potential on one of those icy moon ocean worlds. Uh, me too, and I think... The, the things we're learning today, Kitty, uh, and over the last few weeks, uh, I think it's pointing us toward the direction of now how to improve this technology, mm -hmm. what to add to it, uh, and how to get us slowly, you know, on track to find a mission there. Which, if you're a little kid uh, today, uh, I think this is going to be your job to fly those <laughs> missions because uh, it takes decades to prepare a mission like, you know, Jupiter or, or Saturn. So, you know, some of us will be at the end of our careers uh, when that happens, and we'll be happy to pass it on to the next generations. But got to start somewhere. So I think I think this is probably baby steps on the right direction. Yeah. That was excellent. Yeah, thank you. So Kevin, passing it over to you. What path led you on board the Nautilus? And you've had you're another one just had such a diverse career path. And I thought I had like kind of heard so many cool things, and then last night you're like, oh, I worked as an electrician, and I was like, what? Yeah, I, uh, so I was a journeyman electrician in California, and then the 08 recession hit, and I went back to school uh, because I was going to work at 
PG&E, but there was a hiring freeze. Mm -hmm. And I made the decision either open registration at uh, the Santa Rosa Junior College would come up or I would get a job offer. Uh, open registration happened. I applied for physics undergrad, basically. Uh, and then a week later, they called and said, come down and sign the paperwork. I was like, nope, I already made my decision. So a uh, matter of a week, I would have been a, had a whole different life. Um, yeah. And then so I did undergrad physics. Uh, and there I built the, I was part of the, the team lead uh, that built the first 3P pocket cube that launched. Uh, and it worked. Uh, and then from that, I went to Montana State for graduate physics. Uh, and I built two more satellites. Uh, one of them still in orbit taking data called It Spins. Um, I did the power system for that. And what and kind of data is it collecting? That one is looking at, it's a single pixel photometer, so I can't get away from these kind of things, apparently. <laughs> uh, and it spins in the plane of the orbit, and it takes uh, basically integration of, I think, like seven degrees or something. And then it does uh, re reverse tomographic imaging, just like an MRI. Uh, and then you can look at the electron density in the ionosphere basically as it slices through. Um, but I realized I kept building circuits, so I switched my major from physics uh, to electrical engineering, and then uh, went back to Santa Rosa because uh, following the love of my life, um, she was in Santa Rosa, and then mm -hmm. moved up to Seattle with her uh, and got a job at the Applied Physics Lab. So I went from space to ocean and uh, and you've been doing a lot of different stuff with the oceans, and you just came out on an expedition right before you came out here, right? Yeah, I was uh, out at uh, La Poche doing some stuff with NOAA Fisheries, uh, and then I'll be on another cruise on the OOI actually with Sarah, uh, mm -hmm. the Atlanta pilot. Um, she's going to work uh, with the Jason crew, and we're going to—I'm going to be working on something called the Deep Profiler. So we'll be turning two moorings and putting three crawlers on the wire. Yeah, that's everybody's got such diverse, interesting paths that have led them here. And it definitely goes to show that there's not one set thing that we have to do. And that's a point that I try to tell so many students on the interactions. Find find your passion, find your niche and just fully. I don't want to say the word exploit it, but just go for it because there's not one set path. There's not one set skill that's required out here. There's a multitude. Everybody plays a part in this puzzle. So Daryl, I want to toss it down to you in the first row. Um, what path led you to come on board? Uh, kind of funny. Uh, um, COVID is kind of <laughs> how I ended up here. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, I started out not really knowing what I wanted to do for school, just going through school, trying to figure it out through college. And then I ended up running into COVID, um, which opened up some opportunities for me for live video production uh, at a church I was going to. I didn't know they were starting to. They started doing video production and I asked if I could volunteer. And they're like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I started doing um, video, live video from there and found a passion and f through that. And then from there, I ended up going to MTSU, Middle Tennessee State University. And from there, I got my, uh, so far, three three years of school from there, learned quite a bit, and it actually led me to an event where I eventually, uh, where I was volunteering at an event at uh, the Murphy Center, which is the event, the big uh, basketball stadium for MTSU, and uh, there was a concert called the Judd Concert, uh, you know, the little band <laughs> a few people know of. Yeah. And then from there, I volunteered to work in the truck from there, and uh, I actually ended up meeting one of the original video heads for, uh, for Nautilus, which is pretty cool. Her name's Mary Nichols. She's pretty cool. Um, she told me about the program, and from there I jumped on, and now I'm on the ship. Yeah, COVID <laughs> brought me all the way here. It's crazy. Awesome. Thank you, Daryl. So we have a question back for the uh, LaserBot team. Uh, and it says, Pablo answered an earlier question about the color of the laser. Green, which is good for general reconnaissance. Do you use other laser colors for other purposes? And could you give an example? 
Uh, yeah, so as you, you've seen today and other days, we use a red laser to to help uh, pilots uh, know where we're shooting. Uh, we uh, also use a ultraviolet laser, uh, which you cannot see because uh, uh, neither the camera nor the our eyes are are are, are typically uh, set for seeing that. Uh, the ultraviolet laser serves to excite. Uh, a mechanism in, in the sample, which is fluorescence. Uh, mm. uh, we also do green fluorescence with the green laser, but it's less intense. We use mostly the green for Raman effect, uh, which is our molecular interactions, our way to measure uh, minerals, mostly. We use the ultraviolet to, um, to excite fluorescence uh, and luminescence in, uh, in organics, all the pigments that we talk about, all the corals and and uh, hopefully sponges next time, uh, and, and yeah, and the red finally for targeting. So yeah, we have three colors. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. So I guess this next question goes out to Chris or Brian. Uh, once we get back, I know there's a lot of the samples will get processed up. But I know y'all have mentioned several times about working in the lab, providing an analog. So what's the next step for this video, or what's the next step for y'all? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so after the dive, um, yeah, after the hurt comes up on deck, uh, once it's secure, we go out and take collect all the samples. Which is one of the cool parts about this job is I get mm -hmm. to be one of the first people to touch all these things that come out of the deep sea, with gloves, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then we bring them into the lab. We measure them, take pictures of them, catalog them, and get them sorted to go out to the various institutions that have requested them. Um, like Boston University has got a bunch of stuff, and then uh, uh, University of Rhode Island. So we get them all packaged up and prepped up and stored in ethanol or formalin or whatever fixative we need for it. Um, and then the really fun part <laughs> is entering all of that information into the computer. So we enter the, we got a, all the logs for the sample numbers, the photos that are associated with those samples and... Were they found on the video? Do you all have to type that in as well? Uh, yep. So we take uh, pictures from the video. We go through the video captures that we take. Mm -hmm. and take the associated photos and stick them in a file with the sample number. So definitely, so I know from a science communication fellow point of view, it's a little bit tricky because we have so many interactions. So after we get off of our watch, we'll still be doing interactions. We'll still be um, having our own photos to highlight and process. But y'all guys are doing that and more. Minus the interaction, y'all guys are processing the samples and you have to go back and create files. So when do y'all ever get a chance to like rest or have downtime? Uh, well, if there's, if we've got a, a break because of weather or if a dive is short or something like that, or this dive we didn't get a whole lot of samples because it was a very short dive. So this should be done relatively quick and then we'll have a break up until, well, hopefully once we get it all done, we'll have a break up until uh, the next dive. Uh, it all kind of depends on the shifts. We kind of get, uh, you get a series of naps mostly is what I've been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is not too bad. I kind of enjoy it. Yeah, I get that. And then, Brian, I see you're already looking at mapping features for an upcoming dive, possibly, or scouting out potential locations. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. As I'm looking at the bathymetry um, for the area, thinking about um, a dive on the very southern end of this feature. We've done two previous dives on um, inside the monument for our next dive. Um, so I'm just basically looking at the bathymetry with a contouring tool, drawing a little profile, seeing what the, how the bathymetry changes and what the steepness of the slopes are um, at different areas around the, the southwest and southeast corners of, of this seamount. Um, so for me, after the dive, um, I frankly don't have all that much to do because Chris and Leela and the rest of the data loggers are so efficient. Um, I think I get in their way in the lab. Um, but I generally go down and take a quick look at the samples they got and discuss what repositories are appropriate 
uh, for what samples. Uh, and then if it's the middle of the night and they're shorthanded and people are asleep, I'll hang out down there and help process samples if it's during the day and, and there's a lot of people in, in the wet lab, I will generally head out and so I'm not underfoot. Um, a lot of times <laughs> the uh, scientists are more um, hindrance than help because we want to be messing with the samples and studying them instead of getting the process labeled and uh, in, a <laughs> in an efficient fashion. Uh, and then once they finish doing all that, I'll sneak back down there and um, study what we actually collected um, a little bit later once everything's properly labeled and cleaned up. Um, and then, yeah, I'll start thinking about um, the rest of the expedition. So I, a lot of times I'm thinking two and three days ahead of what we're doing when we're not in the water, um, you know, focused on the dive at hand. But as soon as the vehicle recovered, I'm starting to think about where we're going what's the weather doing, where are we going to have the highest likelihood to dive. If mm -hmm. it's moderate weather, we generally don't go as deep. Um, if it's better weather, those are opportunities to go on the, um, the east side of the seamounts on the steeper terrain uh, and go deeper. Uh, and now we're getting close enough to the end of the expedition that we actually have to start paying a little more attention to priorities and how much time we spend here and there um, thinking about getting to all the different features we want to get to um, now that we have yeah, a little that better we... idea of, of what the weather's been like, how many dives we've lost due to weather, mechanical problems. Uh, and now it gets to be the hard crunch time of, well, what are we actually going to sacrifice? Um, and then always the point of making sure we don't, <laughs> we don't do our math wrong and end up coming to port a day late or something, which really mucks up everything. Um, so there's a little bit of psychic abilities needed to guess exactly what transit speed we'll make on the transit back and things like that. Mm -hmm. Estimating the weather and the swell of whether we're not going to really make normal transit speed or we're going to have to be slower. Um, so yeah. So where do you think we're going to be heading to after this? So we're, the next dive will be on this same feature somewhere on the southernmost side inside the monument. Uh, and then after that, We'll either do a dive on the north side of this feature or we'll head up towards, um, there's a, a longer ridged shaped fe feature in the northeast corner of the USEZ that we'll likely move up that way for a couple dives or potentially backtrack to uh, GEO 9, which we skipped due to weather. Mm -hmm. um, that's not an ideal direction because that eats a, that's a pretty far distance between uh, what we were planning as 11 and 12. Sites 11 and 12 planning from 9 is a good 100 nautical miles. Um, Ooh, so if we go quite back a bit. to 9, that'll cost us a lot of transit time. Um, but we've got a little more time left this week than we'd originally planned to spend on 11 and sites 10 and 11. So that's a discussion. Adam, Leela, Dwight, and I will have probably today or tomorrow, and Deb, um, is to look at kind of how we want to play that and how we can best handle those transit distances if we want to go back to nine, or we want to just spend more time either down here or on 11 or tw uh, 10 and 11. So several really good options available. Yeah, several really good options and not, a, and not an obvious clear winner which a lot of times make those are the harder decisions when you've got lots of good options with no clear logical direction behind them. Uh, and then I'll start, uh, this week I'll start messing with some of the data more, pulling up. We've got enough data now to start um, playing with patterns, looking at the um, real-time annotations uh, Chris and his colleagues have been making. Um, I'll start plotting some of that stuff up and seeing if any kind of obvious patterns fall out. Um, usually they don't at this point. It, the data takes so much cleaning and kind of interpretation and merging with other data sets. Um, but I'll probably play with that a little bit uh, this week or on our transit back. Mm -hmm. Hey, Katie. Yes. So you always ask us what, how we got on Nautilus, but how did you end up on Nautilus? Long, complicated path. <laughs> um, yeah, 
long, complicated path. But I am an educator, first and, first and foremost. I teach an oceans program at Flower Bluff, um, yeah, Flower Bluff ISD over in Corpus Christi, uh, about two hours north of the Mexican border. And uh, I got the greatest gig in the world. I go kayaking at once a week, we kayaking field trips. I get to bring in people from Texas A&M University and the University of Texas Marine Science Institute to talk to my students. Um, we get to help with restu oyster restoration bags. I've gotten to visit the very first um, oyster mariculture um, or aquaculture farm in Texas, permit number 00001. Um, so many different cool things. Strong background in marine science, work for Texas Parks and Wildlife, National Marine Fisheries. Yeah, all kinds of all over the place. Yeah. yeah. And so you came aboard here as a communicator to yep, yep. share third. what we do here with everybody else? Yeah, third season aboard. So, so thankful. Once in a lifetime opportunity that I've been given three times now. Um, first trip was with Ocean Networks Canada and that was a really, really interesting one because we got to see all three different plates. So the Juan de Fuca, the Pacific, and the uh, Continental American or North American plate and got to see how all this data is being sensed. So like ginormous cabled observatory with all kinds of different technology attached to it, stuff that I didn't even know existed. And I learned a lot. I uh, got to see one of those cool surfboards go out, you know, that just kind of zooms around. Uh, got to watch a robot being launched. We had larval traps, so it looked, it was really, really cool, but it was so simple where it was just four PVCs connected in like a cross pattern. And then we'd lower it down to the seafloor and set it down there, come back six months, a year later, and then the traps will have trapped in all these little baby larvae. And then we got to see what kind of was living in there. Again, I never got to see the analyzed data from that. But that was just so interesting. And then seeing everybody's different path about marine instrumentation, about uh, bioacoustics, and then just mechanical acoustics. Very, very interesting. And then last year, got to test out the DRIX, the brand new mapping system, which will be coming out later again this year, where it is a autonomous vehicle that was able to go around and map near Nihau Island or Nihoa Island and Papahanaumokuakea. Actually, Nihoa and Nihau, we got to do both. And now I'm out here for this one. Yay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Chris. It's a great journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and I'm looking at some interesting little critters in the still cam. Looks like a little tinafore moving through. Morning. Good. Say again, if that was for Ren. Uh, sure, I have a second. Uh, so Ren, you are the pilot for the at, for at Atlanta. Will you tell us a little bit about what you're doing when the vehicle is going up and how fast the vehicle is going up? Uh, yes, we're going up at about 22 meters per minute and when I'm basically focused on is making sure that Atlanta is ascending at the same rate as Hercules. So 
As Hercules ascends, we don't want the tether to, uh, or we don't want Atlanta to come too high above it or too low below it, unless we stretch out the tether and uh, pitch either of the ROVs awkwardly. So I'm just trying to match speed, match ascent rate. And is this kind of a, um, an auto, like an autopilot kind of thing, or do you have to keep your finger on the trigger the whole time? We have a, um, a device to make sure that the winch is going at a constant rate. And then you said the winch is the little blue screen on your box, right? The little blue box? Negative. On nope. the ROV pilot page, there's a uh, circular dial that currently oh. reads negative 22. That's the winch indicator. And negative 22 means that the winch is actively working? Yes, yeah, so we're going at uh, about 20, we're ascending at about 22, 22. Uh, meters per minute. Very cool, thank you so much. Wow, we're heading up pretty fast, 430 meters left. So if I did my calculations right, we're 21 minutes to the surface. Oh, little critter. Uh, so a question online came in. Why did we jump from 146 to 149? There were two shakedown cruises at the beginning of the season that were, um, they're just not on the Nautilus page because they weren't really live streaming. But those were just shakedown cruises to make sure all the gear was properly ready to go and that these expeditions would be a success.
Brian, do you have to stay up here for the whole ascent? Okay. Oh, what is that? I'm hoping to see some more tuna like they did yesterday. We went through the, the highlights and could not find that tuna. Found several sharks. Really? Yeah, we didn't find and several fish, but we didn't see the tuna s swimming across. But we weren't using uh, the still cam footage, so ours is a little bit different, and it only t happens like I want to say. Oh, are you looking for in the stills? You weren't looking at the video. Uh, it's like the video pings. So I think it captures it like once every thirty seconds, once a minute, and it's on like an auto timer. So many interesting jellies, tinopores, uh, siphonophores, as we're slowly moving up. Yeah, as much as I complain about how little we know about the deep sea benthic communities, we know even less about the midwater communities. But that's, uh, there is a strong effort to change that, right? With um, robots such as the Mesobot. Yep. Is the dive bot coming out for the next dive or is it off for the next dive? Off. So as soon as it gets, or the ROV gets back on deck, are y'all gonna start taking the laser off or leave it on for a bit, eat some breakfast, chill out, then take it off? I think, I think <laughs> sleep would be amazing. Oh my gosh, yeah. Y'all guys have been up the entire night. So a huge shout out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, did y'all guys get to sleep any last night? No. Yeah, 30 minutes, yeah, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Solid rim cycle right there. Like eight to 11 or something like that, slept last night. Gotcha. Question online, do we ever try to catch any fish from the deck? I so wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, but no. There was that flying fish that caught itself. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Jumped yes. onto the deck. That was, that was pretty funny. Uh, so we always joke about, you know, we see tons of mahi-mahi. Yesterday, Brian saw tuna. And so we're like, oh man, if only we could go fishing and we have these beautiful uh, flying fish kind of schools that go by and one of the flying fish caught itself, just kind of jumped onto the boat. And no, we don't go f uh, swimming either as much as so many times I would love to jump in, but definitely not right now. We've been seeing a white tip or several white tips every time we um, exit the water. Oh, so somebody else saw the, the tuna on the recovery yesterday. Told you I wasn't crazy. Oh, no, 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 I don't, <laughs> definitely not. But I was hoping to catch a photo of it. I'm ready. If we see a tuna again, I got it on capture, or I'll put it on the uh, oh, highlights reel. Go find wherever the the video is stored and replay the video. Oh. I don't see it on Nautilus Share. I, I have to figure yeah. out where it's stored. Oh no, because 
Paula turned him up and I said, you had him. <laughs> Yep, to the person that just wrote in about why we're seeing uh, all the mahi and all the white tips, you are 100% correct. Two hundred and forty meters to go. And this is about the line for we, we consider crossing into the mesophotic, where you'll start picking up uh, actual surface light. It'll be a little while. It'll be a ways before the the vehicle cameras can see it. But out in this part of the ocean, generally, photosynthesis is enough light is available for photosynthesis somewhere between 200 and 250, 260 meters here. I just bought that book by Edie Wither. Is that it? Uh, about bioluminescence and detest detecting other creatures yeah. in yeah. the deep sea. I have not read it. I have not either, but I'm really kind of looking forward to reading it when I get home. My next science kind of non-fiction-y book is The Invention of Nature, a kind of a history of Alexander von Humboldt's travels and work. Oh, interesting. So I used to go out um, for like those really technical kind of books, the nonfiction books that I just, I have a struggle to read. I used to go out every Sunday to the beach and I would sit there for an hour or two and I would read a chapter, swim a little bit, read a chapter, swim a little bit. And that's how I was able to get through so many tough nonfictions or textbooks. I need to start that up again. Got a couple of denser books I would like to read. And yes, we are in the Pacific Oceans, for those that are wondering. Uh, we are outside the remote Pacific Islands Marine National Monument boundary. 7.27 7 degrees north by 161.2 west. Nice. Did you just know that off the top of your head, or is there a No, screen? I have it right in front of me. Oh, okay, I see it.
What's the most exciting thing that you have seen in the blue water over your career? I think mine is the ocean oceanic white tip. Um, probably we two years ago when we were over in Howland and Baker on Falcor, we got a drive by by a whale shark. That's in, right. In you said that. Water. Yeah. That was pretty exciting. Came by twice. Wow. If you actually drive around out here in an RV and look at some of the stuff, like it, this, the it's so um, fragile and delicate and beautiful. Um, and you know, a six thousand pound RV is not an ideal thing to look at something that weighs less than a gram and is, you know, super super fragile. But when you take the time to do it, and if you've got really good pilots, you can get really good, shockingly good imagery of it, even from a platform like this and just the completely truly alien looking design and shape of some of these organisms is amazing and then you throw in the bioluminescence or the like with the tinafores they're they can be bioluminescent but often what you see is those comb rolls their propulsion um, they refract in rainbow colors and so it looks like they're bioluminescing all across the spectrum but it's really a refraction of the are these lights but they can just be so beautiful to watch them just swim i yeah tina pores are some of my favorite because of that biological mirrors that beautiful light that they refract uh are there oh, any advances the in technology that this are oh, so you if see you something? look in the oh, there it is um, i've seen this before and i've never i've yet to figure out what it is um but generally it's right between 120 and 150 meters or so. Um, and you see this, these flashing, it's a pretty thin layer. It's usually only about 10 meters or so. You run through it and it disappears. Wow, it looks like stars twinkling. Hi. Oh, hello there. Hello. We're just looking at all the stars twinkling. All right. Well, then I'll just hang out. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to move over there. Enjoy your breakfast slash recovery. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. Do I hear music? Uh, are you on? Oh, I'm on. Uh, oh, it's some other one. No. No. Blue. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Is that always music? <laughs> That's cool. It's just my lovely singing this early in the morning. <laughs> so Adam Bryan was just telling us what's the coolest thing he's seen on a midwater dive. Have you seen anything really neat? Uh, I don't. I don't think I've ever done a midwater dive. Um, or just like when you're coming back up through the blue water? Yeah, I haven't. I mean, you know, the f the I think he maybe was mentioning like you flash your lights and then yeah. stuff flashes yeah, back. Yeah. Um, but I've done a lot of, not for a long time, but towed camera work. So not a vehicle, just like a camera system that's towed behind the ship. Oh, 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 oh. I heard like towed, like ribbit, ribbit, froggy towed. No, no, no. T-O-W-E-D. Uh, and then that goes through the water column and sometimes you catch, because it's strobing uh -huh. uh, and it's quiet, sometimes you catch some cool stuff like vampire squid and other things like that. So neat. Isn't that kind of how they call it the, uh, the giant squid in the gulf with the tow cam? 
I don't know. It seems like my son would be so excited if we saw a giant squid or isn't there something beyond that like super colossal, colossal yeah or something? something but i think they must be somewhat sensitive to the light and sound of the vehicle because i never even caught a glimpse Question online, do we only eat seafood while out at sea? I suppose that's true, because all the food we eat, we're in the sea, so it is technically sea, seafood. seafood, but no, unless... The I'm very much looking forward to some bacon later on today. Sea bacon. Sea bacon. <laughs> Who was mentioning, I think Samantha, that some kelp that there's a kelp farmer she knows who oh. well this is a time where I have to sign off of SPL and sit quietly so for all those uh, comms are going quiet for a bit other than ROV and navigator Did you guys pick up some rocks down there? Nice. Deck control. the winch to 10 meters per minute, please. Go to winch to 10 meters per minute. Copy. Tell me what to do. Uh huh. Yeah, I get you. Covered. I know you like it hot, but not too hot, right? Nautilus Bridge, Nautilus Deck. Go ahead. Yeah, I have eyes on Atlanta, permission to recover Atlanta and Herc. Charlie to recover. Control van, you copy? I have eyes on Atlanta. Roger that. Yeah. 
some <laughs> samples of what they lasered? Uh, no, but they're stuff that we know. Like if there's a hemicoralia, the fair per se, it is fun. All stations, uh, we just uh, need to hook on Atlanta one more time. Roger.